Guys, this is Cambridge in 5 Minutes and today we're going to be covering the fundamentals of chemical bonding. For free comprehensive notes, go to www.freeexamacademy.com but without further ado, let's begin. So this is a, a periodic table. We took a brief look at this in the previous video, but basically it organizes all the elements that we know of in a single table. What's really important is that it organizes elements into groups, and the groups are basically uh, columns, right? So you've got column one, column two, sort of ignore the middle here. Uh, you will learn about it in the future, but you don't really need to know it now column 3, column 4, column 5, and so on. And the columns are important, or the groups are important, because it tells you how many electrons there are in the atoms, um, well, how many outer electrons there are in the atoms within that group, right? So for example, in group 1, all of these elements here have one electron in, in its outer shell. Um, all the atoms within group 7 have seven electrons in its outer shell and this is important because as we talked about in the previous video it tells you what an atom needs to do in order to gain a full amount of electrons or full outer shell of electrons because that's the goal of every single atom out there so if uh you know for example fluorine it's in group seven so therefore it has seven electrons in its outer shell we know that it just needs one extra electron uh, to make a full outer shell uh, so it would rather gain one electron than to lose seven because it's easier that way. Uh, here in, to the left hand side, for example, lithium here, it's within group one. So it has one electron in its outer shell and all it needs to do is remove one electron from its outer shell to obtain a full outer shell. If you're not familiar with this, go back to my previous video, have a quick look and come back to this one after you're familiar with the concepts. Another really important thing is that you have metals and non-metals. Metals are the blue ones here towards mainly the left hand side of the periodic table and the yellow ones are non-metals. The main thing is that non-metals usually have you know more than four electrons in its outer shell so non-metals tend to gain electrons in order to achieve a full outer shell and therefore atomic stability whereas metals tend to lose electrons because they usually only have one, two, or three electrons in its outer shell. They usually remove their outer shell electrons to achieve a full outer shell. So they have, you know, they do opposite things. Not metals and non-metals do opposite things, right? Um, so, you know, the, the metals in the middle here, they're technically metals and they're called transition metals, but you don't really need to worry about that at this stage. Pay more attention to the group 1 and group 2 metals because those ones are the ones that are going to be popping up more and more often in your course. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to be looking at is the distinction between atoms and ions, right? So as I said before, metals lose electrons to obtain a full outer shell and non-metals gain electrons to obtain a full outer shell. For example, in sodium we have, you know, it's in group 1, so it's got one electron in its outer shell. All it needs to do is lose that one electron to gain a full outer shell because that outer shell simply disappears and it leaves it with two shells and the outer shell now has a full set of electrons which is eight out eight eight electrons in the shell um, so when a metal loses an electron that means it becomes a cation right because it has a charge now remember in an atom the number of protons will always equal the number of electrons therefore the charge is always ba ba uh, sort of cancel out but in this case here if the sodium atom loses one electron that means that there will now be one extra proton or in fact one less electron um, and therefore, there will be more protons than electrons now. Therefore, it will have a positive charge. So a positive ion is called a cation. Oppositely, in a chlorine atom, you have seven outer electrons. All it needs to do is gain one electron. And when it does so, now that you have more electrons than protons, in this case, in this case one ele extra electron than protons, it will become a negative charge and a negative ion is called an anion. So basically when an atom gets charged because it loses or gains electrons it becomes an ion and there's two types of ion. There's the positive one which is what we call a cation and a negative ion whereby we call it an anion. So basically metals because they lose electrons they'll always become cations and 
um, and, and non-metals because they usually gain electrons when they gain electrons and you have that electron proton imbalance then that's um, an anion and that becomes really important but if you look at this diagram here the fact that sodium needs to lose an, a single electron and a chlorine atom simply needs to gain uh, an electron you see a possible win-win situation happening here so that's exactly what happens and ionic bonding it's basically the bonding between metals and non-metals metals basically donate electrons to non-metals that really need it so both atoms will obtain a full outer shell and become ions in the process cations and anions are obviously they have different charges cations have positive and anions have negative charges and therefore they are attracted by strong electrostatic forces opposites attract so when that happens we call that ionic bonding so for example here in this case a sodium atom will donate will happily donate its outer shell electron to the chlorine atom which will happily receive it so they'll both be happy because now they have full outer shells sodium becomes a cation the chloride ion becomes an anion and because they have opposite charges they are attracted to each other similarly a magnesium can actually form ionic bonds with chlorine as well in this case though the magnesium ion will well the magnesium atom will need to lose two outer electrons in order to achieve a full outer shell so therefore it basically donates it one to each chlorine atom so the two chlorine atoms will happily accept those and so they will all bond together via ionic bonding and in which case one magnesium ion will combine with two chlorine ions because you know there's two chlorine atoms that had received an electron each so the chemical formula in this case would be MgCl2 signifying that for every magnesium ion there's two chlorine or chloride ions so the previous diagrams sort of you know diagrammically tell you how things work but in reality the final structure of an ionic compound doesn't simply look like that it looks like this whereby ions a lot of ions are they form a regular structure whereby the ions alternate from positive to negative positive to negative and they form a regular structure and that's what we call a lattice um, and you know all these are ionic bonds all the ions attracted to each other held by ionic bonds ie the electrostatic forces of attraction that they have uh, because they're oppositely charged but donating and accepting electrons is not the only way atoms can bond so there's something called covalent bonding whereby there's no donation or anything like that but simply atoms share a pair of electrons or two pairs or three pairs right so this is only capable this is this only happens between two non-metallic atoms okay so or several non-metallic atoms the idea is that non-metals can share electrons with other non-metals to form covalent bonds so but by sharing electrons all atoms will obtain a full outer shell take a look at hydrogen here so two hydrogen atoms are sort of looking around seeing if they can obtain a full outer shell and they realize that if they share their electrons like so both hydrogen atoms now have a full outer shell because they've got two okay so these two electrons are shared uh, amongst the two atoms okay so this one now has two and this one now has two and so this is a sharing of a pair of electrons and this is what we call a single covalent bond In water similarly you've got hydrogens looking to achieve a full outer shell and you've got the oxygen quite simply if all of these shared a pair of electrons like so you can see that oxygen has eight okay so that's a full outer shell um, and hydrogen has two and that's also a full outer shell two is a full uh, two electrons is a full outer shell for hydrogen because this is in its first shell whereas oxygen this is in its second shell and therefore it has a capacity of eight so therefore it needs eight electrons uh, to achieve a full outer shell and you can see that everyone is happy here um, you don't always share a pair of electrons though sometimes you can have uh, you know two pairs of electrons being shared and that's called a double bond and if you share three pairs of electrons that's when we call it a triple bond 
There are a lot of different examples that Cambridge wants you to understand and I've gone through all of this in the website www.freeexamacademy.com so please check that out. Um, and otherwise, we will move on to the idea of intermolecular versus intramolecular forces. This is really important, right? So here, this is a, you know, this is a group of water molecules, okay? This is what you find in a glass of water. The solid line represents intramolecular forces. This is basically covalent bonds, right? These are extremely strong. The bonds that you form between atoms inside the molecule are really, really strong. The dashed lines, however, are intermolecular forces. This is very different. This is the forces between molecules, not between atoms. So these bonds are much weaker. Now, when we boil water, Water, we're breaking apart not the solid lines, but we're actually breaking apart the dashed lines, and this is really important. So that's why water isn't that hard to boil because the dashed lines or the intermolecular forces between the bonds are not that powerful. That brings us to the topic of macromolecules. Macromolecules, on the other hand, are giant molecules where millions of atoms are joined to one another through intramolecular bonds or covalent bonds, right? So all these atoms are bonded through covalent bonds, okay? So diamond, is an, diamond and graphite are both examples of macromolecules of carbon. So the atoms, because they're all joined by covalent bonds, when you try to melt a diamond, you're actually trying to not break apart the intermolecular bonds this time because they don't have any, you're trying to break apart the covalent or the intramolecular bonds and that's why they are extremely hard, they have really really high melting points, you, it's, it's, it's really hard to melt these things, okay? Um, so you do need to understand the properties of diamond, graphite and silicon dioxide um, and this too I have covered in the website so go there for further detail but basically for, for diamond, you just need to know that the, the carbon is joined to four other carbon molecules and graphite, each carbon is bonded to three other carbon molecules um, and they have a layer-like structure like so. Therefore, they um, sort of, they have a slippery nature because within layers, the layers are not, the attraction between each layer is not that powerful so the layers can actually slide over pretty easily. Uh, but it's obviously fairly hard to break apart the atoms within each layer. Silicon oxide is fairly similar to the structure of a diamond and you can see the diagram as follows. And the last thing we need to look at is metallic bonding. So metallic bonding is basically what you find in all metals, right? In metals, atoms will remove their outer electrons and become cations. Remember, metals will remove their electrons to become or obtain a full outer shell and therefore become cations. Cations are arranged in a lattice structure, remember lattice structure is basically another word for a regular sort of structure, uh, like follows. And so the outer electrons are they're, deloca they, they're, they're, they're delocalized, meaning they can move sort of freely within the structure and they form the sea of electrons. So what you have are a regular layer or regular arrangements of these cations and um, a free delocalized um, sea of electrons surrounding it. So what happens is the cations um, are attracted by forces of electrostatic attraction to the sea of electrons surrounding it and this attraction is what bonds the structure together and this is metallic bonding. So this is just a quick example and you know these are named examples like zinc and sodium and what it would look like at a molecular level if you were to zoom up on it. Okay, so that's it for today guys. Thank you for watching. As again, um, as I said before, go to my website for extra revision notes, like, share and subscribe and comment for extra exam tips, any sort of content requests or even blog requests on the website. Um, thank you and I'll see you in the next video.